Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at Greg Kokel's channel, Stand to Reason. In this video, they are answering a listener question about what to say to a friend who has deconstructed their faith, to which the correct answer is, mind your own goddamn business. But we know that that's never a solution that apologists are ever willing to even consider, so naturally they turned out a nearly 15 minute episode. I say that as if 15 minutes is long for me. I chose to respond to it because I think they accidentally do a really good job demonstrating that Christianity is not true, as long as we put some thought into the implications of the things that they are saying. So let's take a look! Let's start with a question from Bronco Girl. What do I say to friends that have deconstructed and left the faith? I still pray for them, but it absolutely breaks my heart. I want to say something to them and acknowledge their pain, but also point them back to God. So right off the bat, we have that thing that Christianity does that I'm going to refer to as weaponized empathy. I'm sure I didn't come up with that, and yeah, now that I've googled it, I'm seeing that it's a term that's usually used in the sense of using someone else's empathy towards a situation that's either not real or not being honestly represented in order to push them towards a desired behavior. Like how the extreme right wing tries to drum up support by claiming that they want to protect cis women from the evil men who would dress up as women and sneak into women's spaces and assault them. And that is most definitely a scenario that I do not want to happen, so that stirs up empathetic feelings for the victims in those scenarios. But the reality of the situation is that trans people, especially youth, are far more likely to be assaulted in such spaces than cis people, and the passages of laws forbidding trans people from using the bathroom of their choice has zero impact on the frequency of such incidents. Anyway, back to what I mean when I say weaponized empathy. It's very similar, except this is an institution, Christianity, weaponizing the empathy of its members to get them to put pressure on other people to either become or remain members of the institution. I'm sure the person asking the question has a genuine concern for their friend, and is distressed at the idea that this person that they care about could wind up in hell being tortured for all of eternity. And so this desire to bring them back into the fold comes from a place of genuine concern for their well-being. But if you take a step back and look at it from another perspective, like, I know apologists are terrible at hypotheticals, but if you could hypothetically approach this from the perspective that Christianity is not true, then can you see how manipulative this whole thing is? It preys on the fears of the vulnerable for their loved one's fates in order to maintain or increase its size, all while explaining that they should really be giving 10% of their income to the institution. Now, if possible, keep this thought in your mind when discussing how to talk to someone who has deconstructed and is no longer a Christian. When you come at them with a clear attempt to get them back into the religion that they are no longer capable of believing, it comes across as a nuisance at best, but realistically they're more likely to see it as manipulative. Well, I, I can think of two th questions that would be worth asking. And one of them is, why did you reconstruct, deconstruct rather, why did you leave? Which is a perfectly valid question if you're actually interested in the answer, and not just looking for a category that the response fits into, thus allowing you to craft a retort designed to pull them back. I don't know how they're going to answer. I have an idea because there are some standard things. Yeah, the standard things would be these categories that the responses can fit into, which will then allow you to follow Kokel's advice from his tactics book and ask leading questions designed to end up at gotcha moments that might make you feel like you won an argument, but won't actually accomplish much in the way of changing minds. Um, the two standard things are bad experiences in the church with other Christians, that's one, and the second is um, uh, th bad theology. In other words, <clears throat> they had a whole bunch of misunderstandings of what the Bible taught. They might be hit with the slavery question or the genocide question, which are I, admittedly difficult to answer. So two categories, either they had a bad experience with someone in the church that drove them away, or they noticed something about the religion that doesn't make sense, which of course gets categorized as bad theology, you know, because if the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe couldn't get his message across in a clear and easy to understand way, that's your fault for not reading enough of the works of the great theologians of history. Given that the various denominations of Christianity can't even agree on theology between themselves, how is it the fault of any layperson for not being able to parse out the things that none of the major religious leaders can parse out either? And so I would suggest uh, that, is it Bronco? Bronco Girl. Bronco Girl 
Ask the questions with a genuine curiosity and an, in a non-judgmental way. I just want to understand. And do not be prepared at that point to counter anything they say. If this video stopped here, that would be the best possible answer that Greg could give. Ask your question, but only if you genuinely want to learn the answer, not with the purpose of answering the answer in an attempt to prove them wrong. If it stopped here, this would be about as decent a video as you could hope to find on a YouTube channel whose main focus seems to be on explaining why treating trans people with respect is against the will of God. But you, my astute viewer, have probably already seen the runtime of my video, and so are aware that this is not the end of Greg's advice. He made the huge mistake of continuing to talk after this. If these are friends of hers, then she's going to have other opportunities. And if she asks a question about the reasons and then she counters, then they're going to feel maybe like they were asked disingenuously or maybe they were trapped. There'll be other opportunities to revisit these, but you want to have a clear understanding of what the concerns and objections were. Yeah, but the way you phrase that kind of gives the game away. Yeah, you said that she should genuinely want to know the answer and not worry about proving her side right, but you immediately follow that up by saying that there'll be other opportunities for that later. Which takes away from the sincerity of the original question. If the only reason you didn't pose any follow-up challenges was so that your challenges would be more effective later on, then that takes a genuine concern and turns it into cold manipulation. You are weaponizing this person's empathy, Greg. Now the third one, though, is a is an attractiveness of things of the world. Ah yes, good old category three of two. And it's the classic, you're just denying God because you want to sin one. The most disingenuous of all the excuses Christians have come up for trying to figure out how people can leave the faith. This should be fun. That is, I don't like what the Bible teaches about hell. I don't like that Jesus is the only way. I don't like especially the sexual restraints and boundaries that the Bible gives. I don't like those things. Now, this is called volitional doubt, and uh, that's another reason why they would move. That's a very different kind of thing. Okay, now that he's got all three of his two reasons firmly on the table, it's time for me to come clean about why I chose to respond to this. It's because I feel like Greg has inadvertently put on full display an excellent argument against Christianity, especially for former Christians. And that is the utter insignificance of the reasons that you can think of why someone might leave Christianity. If Christianity is true, then Christians have direct access to God. Luke 11, 9 through 13 makes this quite explicit. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This direct access also implies a certainty that when you die, you will be treated to an eternity of paradise. If someone has that kind of access to God and the resulting certainty of eternal paradise, do you really think that a bad experience or a misunderstanding about some details about theology or a desire to do something that God forbids, like eating shellfish, would cause so many people to completely flip and claim that they no longer believe that God even exists? That would be like if my father were ultra wealthy and had put in his will that I was going to inherit a billion dollars when he dies. My brother then tells me that he's actually broke because he lost his fortune gambling. So instead of going to my father and asking about it, I just decide to completely sever ties with him and never speak to him again. That would be completely bonkers, but that's what apologists are pretending happens when a Christian deconstructs. Except worse, because not only would a Christian know for certain that heaven is real, they also know for certain that hell is real. So they are actively choosing to be sent to eternal torture because planting different kinds of plants in the same field is just too darn tempting. <clears throat> They're their own standard of morality, or the culture is, and they want to go with the culture. Uh, rather than with Christ, okay? Apropos of nothing, here's a clip of Greg explaining how our moral intuitions are evidence for an objective moral standard. If it seems to our moral common sense, our moral intuition, that these words and these concepts that we constantly use are describing something real and we have no reason to doubt they're real, then moral relativism must be 
false. Okay, I confess, I lied. That wasn't apropos of nothing. That was, in fact, the exact opposite of apropos of nothing. And I definitely didn't write this into the script purely because apropos is just a fun word to say. Anyway, this is a classic apologist have your cake and eat it too moment, where they use the fact that most people can agree on a handful of big ticket moral stances, like saying murder is wrong, in order to claim that an objective external source is required for morality. But then they turn around and say that we deny the existence of God because our moral intuitions don't match up with the moral dictates of Christianity. So rather than admit that we like to do things that are bad according to the objective moral standard, like say sitting on a chair that was previously sat on by a woman on her period, we instead deny the very existence of that standard because we're just so interested in the momentary satisfaction that comes from wearing clothes made out of mixed fabrics that we don't care that this desire to sin will ultimately lead us to being eternally tortured, which we established earlier is a thing that a former Christian should know with absolute certainty. So on the one hand, we can figure out that God is real because we all agree on morality. But on the other hand, when we say that God's not real, that's because we disagree on morality. I'm sure the apologists will be happy to reply that we know in our hearts that the wrong things that we're doing, like boiling baby goats in their mother's milk, are actually wrong, we're just denying or suppressing that truth. But remember how earlier I mentioned that this is an especially good argument against Christianity for former Christians? This is what I mean. When you tell other Christians that former Christians just want to sin, maybe that's sufficient to keep them convinced of Christianity. But when you tell a former Christian that, they know with a greater degree of certainty than it is possible to have about nearly anything else in life that you are just wrong. Because I know my own thoughts and feelings better than Greg Kokel does. So if Christianity requires that Greg know better what's going on in my own head than I do in order to be correct, then I can say for certain that Christianity is not correct. I may not be able to convince others that I'm not just, say, lying about my own thoughts and feelings, so this isn't an argument that's likely to convince anyone else, but you're not going to win anyone back to the faith that they lost by telling them that they are wrong about their own thoughts and feelings. So that's one question that they could ask. Um, just the reasons. So remember, you're supposed to ask the reason why they deconstructed in a genuine and non-judgmental way without being prepared to give a response. But then he followed the question up by priming the asker with three categories of responses that he would expect. So as the person is answering, don't respond to them right then and there, but make mental notes about how you could respond in the future by first figuring out which category their answer fits in. In other words, don't actually be genuine and non-judgmental. Fake it so that you can use Greg's tactics, literally the title of his book, by the way, to get them to lower their guard so that you can manipulate them back into Christianity. And here's the second question that should be asked a lot, I think. Okay, I, I understand that you love Christianity. What's the alternative? If I examine a belief system and determine that I'm not convinced that it's true, I don't need to provide an alternative. I'm just not convinced that it's true. I can fart bismuth crystals. I even have a container that I've labeled Crystal Bismuth, where I keep my farted bismuth crystals. This is one from this morning. This one was last week. My God, this one hurt. I have actually provided physical evidence to you that I can, in fact, fart bismuth crystals. What is your alternative to believing that this is true? You don't need one. You can just say, I don't believe you, and then move on with your life. Now, maybe they land in atheism, maybe they land in progressive Christianity, which is a veneer of Christianity, but none of the doctrine. <laughs> what is with these fundamentalist Christians laughing at the very concept of a version of Christianity that's not hateful? And why I'm not a progressive Christian. <laughs> like, seriously, the fact that modern Christians mostly oppose slavery would make them progressive Christians if they went back to the 1700s. Now, Christian apologists give Christianity credit for ending the slave trade, even though the spread of Enlightenment principles is mostly what did it. And Enlightenment principles were quite progressive for the time. I'm sure there were conservative preachers in the 1700s preaching about the evils of abolition in the same way that modern conservative preachers preach about the evils of homosexuality. But by verse count, there are a grand total of six that condemn homosexuality, if I include the ones that weren't interpreted that way until the 1940s, and that one in Jude that talks about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah indulging in sexual immorality and pursuing unnatural desires. If we narrow it down to the ones that explicitly condemn homosexuality itself and ignore the fact that they might be better interpreted as condemning pederasty, it gets whittled down to two, maybe three, depending on how we look at the one in Romans. 
There are 181 verses that explicitly mention the word slave in the Bible, and zero of them are a condemnation of slavery or a command to not own slaves. Now sure, most are in narrative bits that are just talking about slaves existing, so that's not exactly an approval of the practice, but there are at least 13 that explicitly approve of slavery, either by explaining how the institution of slavery is supposed to be run, or by telling slaves to obey their masters, and masters to not be overly harsh to their slaves. So it is pretty clear that, if we were taking this as an indication of God's priorities, he is much more concerned with making sure slaves know their place than he is with gay people being gay. And yet, modern Christians will say that they oppose slavery, while making excuses for indentured servitude, that's a whole other thing, I've got videos on that, you can go take a look at those, all while laughing at the very idea that they would ever be accepting of LGBTQ people, because that's progressive Christianity, and we all know that that's not real Christianity. Y'all are just using religion as a shield for your bigotry. It's way easier to make a case that God doesn't condemn homosexuality than it is that he does condemn slavery. Yet you can't bring yourself to even acknowledge that fact. All this to say that what counts as progressive is relative to the culture of the time, and all these apologists laughing at the idea of progressive Christianity would be condemned by Christians of the past for being way too progressive. So that might be um, another another reason they go to that, and that's part of the volitional doubt I talked about earlier. They're going; they don't like these things, so they're going to adopt a a faux. Christianity, and I'm, I'm, I'm using my words advisedly here, it's a phony Christianity. So, not even going to try and hide the fact that you're just no true Scots manning it up? These Christians disagree with me about what it means to be a Christian, so they're not true Christians. And that way, I can say that anyone who goes from a hardcore fundamentalist evangelical Christian to a more progressive denomination are not true Christians. And really, if we're still looking at this from the hypothetical perspective of people denying God in order to sin, then that makes even less sense. I was a part of true Christianity, but I decided that I had a moral disagreement with the guy who I know for sure exists and is the source of my morality, so I adopted a different view of Christianity that has the same God at the center, but we're actually denying that God's existence in order to disagree with his morality. That's just weird. Also, I skipped a bit where he describes what progressive Christianity is, because honestly, that's a theological fight between denominations, and I don't usually comment on that sort of thing. But it is worth mentioning that he seems to think that progressive Christianity is some monolith in the same way that apologists often think atheism is a monolith. All progressive Christians apparently go so far as to deny the divinity of Jesus, the importance of the Bible, etc., etc., and so forth. I know for a fact that that is not the case. There are various degrees of progressive Christians, and I'd wager that the vast majority of them would deny his description of them. When describing someone else's position with the goal of refuting that position, ideally you want to describe it in a way that that person would themselves agree with. As Elisa Childers says with her book title, it's another gospel. And of course, salvation on that is social justice. It isn't rescue from sin. The real question here is why would God not be concerned with social justice? Does he not want equal rights, treatment, and opportunities for marginalized people? Is God not concerned with having a fair world where people aren't discriminated against for things that they have no control over? And if he's not, can we really say that this God is good and wants what is best for us? And so um, Asking what's the alternative is important because people always have to go to something. Now, if they go, no matter what they go to, there are going to be problems with that. In fact, there's going to be more problems ideologically with what they go to than what they came from. Strong disagree. When I was a Christian, I didn't believe that LGBTQ people should have equal rights. Now, I do. And actually, I take issue with the word ideologically there, especially when it comes to something that has a lot of data backing it up. It is a fact of reality that giving LGBTQ people equal rights has only positive outcomes and no negative ones, which would be a really weird fact to exist about a reality that was designed by an all-powerful being who thinks that being LGBTQ is sinful and wrong. And hell, this even holds true if you're one of those callous individuals who thinks that the only metrics that matter in these situations are the impacts on the economy, as there is a mutually reinforcing relationship 
between economic development and LGBTQ inclusion. So it's not a matter of ideology here. Ideology refers to ideas that are held for reasons that are not necessarily epistemic in nature. To believe that giving people equal rights regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity is a good thing has firm epistemic justification. The data is all there, and it's super easy to find. The belief that these rights should be denied, however, relies on beliefs about reality that are not themselves grounded in reality and frequently run counter to reality. However, if they're leaving and it's because of volitional doubt, I don't like this, I like that. Well, you know, atheism's, atheism's better. You do whatever you want. No standards except for your feelings. Well. I think I've already laid out a pretty comprehensive case that the only reason modern apologists are anti-LGBTQ rights, while also being anti-slavery, is because of their feelings rather than the moral standard that they claim to hold. So at worst, this isn't any different than how modern Christians approach these issues. But in reality, ditching religion entirely allows you to more thoughtfully examine issues that were dogmatic or ideological in nature. An anti-LGBTQ Christian can see that the data shows no reason to discriminate against LGBTQ people, but because of their ideological beliefs, they have to do it anyway. What seems right to you at the moment? Oh, that gives you a tremendous sense of liberty. That was me in the mid-60s. You know, this is a pattern in apologetics that I've noticed. The whole, I used to be the kind of person who thought that I was the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong, so I sowed my many wild oats, had all the sex, did all the drugs, until I found Jesus, learned the error of my ways, and now advocate that nobody go through a wild phase in their youth. As a one-off or an occasional story element, I can see how that could be effective, but when it's a common element in nearly every apologist's story, it starts to look more like an I got mine, now I want to stop you from getting yours sort of thing. Everyone did some crazy shit when they were young, even the good little church folks. And most people do settle down as they age. That's kind of a natural progression. So to take this natural progression and say, well, because of my religion, I realize that my natural progression was a mistake, so I'm advising you not to even have one, just start out like a boring old person, seems naive at best. Yeah, to the degree that it's not just, I get to do my thing, you get to do your thing, but rather I get to do my thing, my thing and you have to agree with it, and you have to approve of it, and you have to celebrate it, or else we're going to hurt you. No, not at all. You're still allowed to be a bigoted piece of shit in your private life. Just keep it to yourself and don't push for legislation to enforce your bigotry onto the general population. Nobody is going to force you to celebrate people that you're bigoted against. Just don't actively do harm to them. Also, for the record, I realize that it might seem like I've jumped too far into the LGBTQ issues with Greg without much prompting. After all, he's barely mentioned it and only alluded to it with references to progressive Christianity. But I feel that this is warranted, given that he's got a whole section of his website dedicated specifically to making it easy to find episodes of his podcast or articles written on his site where he puts his bigotry on full display. Everything from saying that Christians shouldn't attend same-sex weddings to explaining why same-sex couples can never practice Christian marriage, to explaining why he thinks it's reasonable to refuse people's preferred pronouns, to a whole half-hour episode where his answer to what a gay couple with a child should do if they convert to Christianity is for them to get a divorce and split up the family, and more. There are, as of this recording, 356 podcasts and articles dedicated exclusively to hating LGBTQ people. So no, I don't think that my going hard on this issue is unwarranted. When I read this question, the thing that stands out to me is she says uh, she wants to acknowledge their pain. And I don't know what she's referring to there. And that makes me think... Bad experience. Bad experience. Church. It seems less likely to me that the pain is coming from leaving and separating from Christians and more likely that it comes from the whatever bad experience they had or perceived bad experience and now we get to the assumptions and the deflection remember ostensibly this whole thing is supposed to be them giving advice to someone who wants to know how to talk to her friend who is deconstructing but so far we're almost seven minutes into their video and all we've got is ask why and don't be prepared to respond to the answer followed by a bunch of pontificating about how nobody actually has any valid reason for leaving Christianity. Now, we've gotten to the point where it's assumed that because the person who left the religion is experiencing pain, then it must have been a bad experience in the church that caused them to leave, 
rather than it just being a fact that when you leave Christianity, that often comes with the price of losing friends and family. People who will no longer talk to you because you're not the same religion as them. Or if they do talk to you, it's exclusively with the goal of convincing you to come back to the religion. That is a painful experience that many former Christians go through, and I'd be willing to bet that it's significantly more common than the I left Christianity because of a bad experience thing. Though, let's be real, that is still a perfectly valid reason for leaving as well. It's basically your own personal problem of evil. If God loved me, he would have protected me from whatever that experience was. And again, let's be real, we're talking about Christian institutions here, statistically that experience was probably being a victim of sexual abuse. My point is, that's a valid reason for leaving, but apologists like to paint it as misguided. They're taking their anger at a human out on God. But it's a situation that the God that they claim to believe in could easily have prevented. So I don't see why that's unreasonable. But of course, it all serves as a nice little distraction from that thing where Christians seem to largely stop caring about you as soon as you stop going to the same weekly club as them. Sometimes people who deconstruct will interpret the upholding of standards as a bad experience, and that causes them pain. Oh, I see. You're going to a potentially even darker place. I don't know if they advocate for similar practices offhand, but I know there are denominations, like the Mormons, where being caught in certain sins could earn you a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a creepy old bishop who would then make you repeat your description of your sin over and over again until he's convinced that you feel a sufficient amount of shame. And of course, such sins are usually sexual in nature. So. Yeah, if that's the kind of thing you're referring to when you say the upholding of standards, then that is most definitely a bad experience. Or, on the less obviously nefarious and perverted side, she is probably referring to something more like listening to a sermon that condemns sex outside of marriage and getting mad because you happen to enjoy extramarital sex. Which, of course, wouldn't actually be the bad experience category. That would be Greg's bad theology category. So you deflect from the possibility that pain is caused by Christians being jerks when you leave Christianity, but then realize that deflecting to the pain was caused by a bad experience rather than Christians being jerks after the fact still leaves us with an end result of Christians that are being jerks, because it's them causing that bad experience. So you had to deflect further from your deflection in order to make sure that the bad experience was just hearing a theologically sound sermon and disagreeing with it. This whole video that is ostensibly answering a viewer's question about how to talk to someone has instead been a disgusting exercise in victim blaming. And apparently that includes just making shit up about the scenario that you have very little information on. But the first thing to say is, if there's something they don't like, or there's something that, uh, or Christians were not nice to them, that doesn't change what is true. Yeah. And that should be what people care about. And what you guys are completely ignoring here is that that is usually what happens during a deconstruction. People realize that they're having a hard time believing that Christianity is true, so they examine it closely, trying to find all the arguments for and against it, looking at all the evidence, and considering the implications of it not being true. And if they end up leaving Christianity as a result of this process, it's not usually because of the reasons that Greg is given. It's because they have not found sufficient reason to continue believing that Christianity is true. But of course, apologists can't ever admit that, because then they'd have to admit that the Bible is wrong when it says that people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So instead, they have to pretend to know what's really going on in a non-believer's head, and insist that all non-believers who are former believers are lying about it. What is true? Now, people have a hard time wrapping their mind around that idea because, first of all, they think religion is all a matter of subjective preference. Yeah. They're not thinking of it in categories of truth. They're thinking of it in categories of what will help me, what will make my life nicer, what in, will give me a community. In the moment. And as an atheist, I can say that that is a perfectly valid way of going about things. Now, also as an atheist, I see that any time a religion winds up wielding political power, the results are disastrous, and that includes religions that even atheists tend to think of as peaceful, like Buddhism, which has been used to justify violence against Muslims in Myanmar. So my personal preference is that religion would just go away. We can take the beneficial practices that come from some religions, like the mindfulness and meditation exercises of Buddhism, the physicality of yoga, the community support of any religion that just has regular meetings, etc., and just ditch the dogma and 
beliefs and things that have no grounding in reality. But I say this as someone who is currently in a permanent romantic relationship with someone who is herself a yogi, who finds fulfillment in activities that she considers spiritual. And I am happy when she is happy, so I have no desire to take that away from her. Does this create some cognitive dissonance for me? Sure but I don't have a dogmatic requirement to be vehemently opposed to all things tied to spirituality in all contexts, because atheism doesn't come with dogma. So while I can say that I would like to see the death of religion, I also recognize that that's not a practical goal at the moment. So if someone finds personal fulfillment in a religion, and they're willing to keep their religion out of politics, then that's fine with me. Also like science and health. Keep it out of science and health. Go to, go to your doctor when you need to go to your doctor. Don't go to your crystal person. Even if I'm your crystal person. You want to buy some farts? You want to buy my, my crystal bismuth farts? Right. They're not asking what's true. And so then Christianity fails them because it's not giving them what they want in the moment mm -hmm. and what they want to hear and the kind of community that they want. Most of the people I know who have deconverted from Christianity did so against their will because it was giving them what they needed in the moment. But they realized that it was not true and they couldn't continue living a lie. And that was a source of great pain for them because of how much of the what they need in the moment was coming from the community of fellow Christians who are often and unwilling to continue allowing a non-Christian to be a part of the community. But again, the existence of such people is something that apologists can never admit to. So they try to flip the reasons people leave and then pretend like the people who left are lying about why they left. Which is actually extra funny given that the opening of this video is them advising someone to ask why their friend left and to be genuinely interested in the answer. But then they followed that up with the rest of the video, which has been them making up straw man versions of that friend, explaining why despite whatever the answers might be, one of these answers is what the real answer will be. So maybe a topic to discuss with them is the idea of truth. Do you think that there is a spiritual truth out there? By the way, there is a spiritual truth. And that, I mean, it might be that there's no spiritual reality, but that is the truth. There is a truth of the mm -hmm. matter here. Sure, fine, whatever. Just like there's a truth about my ability to fart bismuth crystals. I had to dig this one out with a fork. Oop, fucking painful. I hate this. Technically, going that route, there's a truth about whatever ridiculous thing anyone cares to put out there. The real question, then, should be whether or not the discovery of the truth about this thing is even worth pursuing. And obviously, the dense metal crystals that come out of my butt are the most important truth that anyone could pursue in their lifetime. Um, whether, whether any particular religion is a true religion, or none of them are true because there, no religious view is accurate, the, then that's a truth as well. Yes. And as Greg is so close to pointing out, all religions can be false, but they cannot all be true. And given that there are good reasons to think that most of them are false, a category in which I would include Christianity, see my video Proof of Not God for more information there, then I see no reason to believe any of the ones that I have not yet examined. If a representative from one of those religions presents me with a good reason to believe it, then I'm open to it. But I have no reason to think that that will ever be a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. So there's a truth out there, and the question is whether people are interested in finding out what reality is actually like, and this is what you're getting to, I think. And what reality is actually like is pretty much exactly what we would expect if an all-powerful, all-knowing, and benevolent God did not exist. So Christians have to come up with all these excuses as to why such a being can exist in a reality that does not indicate its existence. Um, or they just want to do whatever they want to do, and, and that's also what, you know, people often uh, gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. Which would be a really weird thing to gravitate towards if Christianity were true and we actually had direct experiences with the God of the universe. Even ignoring the direct experience thing, in the Christian worldview, any sin can be forgiven except blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is usually interpreted as dying without accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, because otherwise they'd be obligated to leave people like me alone, because that's a thing that I've definitely done. Also, there's that whole argument that I've made many times before, that if you actually really believe in Christianity deep down, you just don't want to follow the rules and want to do the sin stuff, denying God's existence only serves to have you wind up in hell pretty much for sure. You would be much better off staying a Christian and just repenting before you die. 
Sure, this carries with it the risk that you'll die in a sudden way that doesn't give you the opportunity to repent, but that is way better than the 100% chance of hell if you deny the whole thing. But this also leads me to another question. It just occurred to me that if that was your plan, the deathbed repentance thing, but then you live to a ripe old age and end up suffering from dementia, it might not be possible for you to do it. But what if you're an atheist, live your life as an atheist, but then get dementia in your old age? You're still alive, but no longer have the possession of your mental faculties. If someone evangelizes to you, and you aren't mentally capable of making the decision to convert and ask forgiveness, but you know that forgiveness is something that you want, what happens to your soul at that point? I would think that the answer would be that it goes to heaven, obviously, but I'm also currently responding to the guy that unironically suggested that a happy family unit with a child go through the painful process of divorce for no reason other than him thinking that gay people are icky. So you never know with people like this. So then after I established the idea that, well, I guess before you can even get in a conversation, what you would have to ask is, are you, are you interested in hearing answers to your concerns? Yeah. Are you interested in finding the truth? Those questions ignore the fact that the way this was described was as a deconstruction. Now, I know that's a word that gets thrown around a lot, and honestly, I wish it was a common term when I was deconstructing, because it better encapsulates what I went through rather than just saying deconverting. The act of deconstructing implies that there was a critical evaluation of some kind, where truth claims were evaluated, where answers to difficult questions were sought, where deep introspection happened, etc. So to approach someone who has already gone through that process and ask them, well, do you want to hear answers to your objections? Are you even interested in learning the truth? Is condescending at best, because it denies the experience that the person went through where if they did want to hear the answers to their objections, they actively were seeking them out. Do you, do you care about the truth? Or do you have some other thing that you're placing above that? Because if they have some other thing, then all you can say is, look, I would really like to talk to you about what's true. If, if ever you want to do that, I'm, I'm open to hearing that. Do these people really think that there are former Christians out there who would be like, nah, I don't actually care about what's true, that's why I left Christianity and I'm doing my own thing? Or are they just so incapable of even hypothetically entertaining the idea that they might be wrong, that they cannot comprehend the idea that someone could have concluded that they were wrong while still caring about the truth? Like, I can hypothetically put myself in a mindset where I'm not an atheist, and a good chunk of my content involves me stating things from the Christian perspective. And admittedly, one of the reasons I can do this is because I am a former Christian. So I can think about what Christian me would say to something, but so many apologists claim to be former atheists, but seem to be completely incapable of even entertaining atheist hypotheticals without completely strawmanning the things that actual atheists say and believe. This is one of the reasons why I doubt the authenticity of so many of the apologists I used to be an atheist stories, because they can't seem to authentically represent things that actual atheists believe, which should be things that they once believed. Now, obviously, as I've said so many times before, atheism is the answer to a single question, do you believe in God? And atheist thought outside of that single answer is by no means a monolith. I said that earlier in this very video, in fact. But there are groupings of common beliefs and worldviews within atheism, subsets of atheists, if you will, caused by people concluding certain things about the world that they consider to be implications of no God existing. And apologists can't even get these subsets right, despite claiming to have been a part of them themselves in the past. Now, if they are open to hearing answers, I think the first thing I would ask is, okay, if Christianity is true, then shouldn't we expect to see people sinning? Mm -hmm. And if Christianity is not true, then we'd expect to see people behaving in ways that Christians believe are sinful. That's not a question that has any meaningful answer when it comes to demonstrating the truth of Christianity. Unless you think that the world would be a better place if Christianity were not true? That's the implication here. If you think that people behaving badly is a consequence of the truth of Christianity, then it logically follows that people would not behave badly, or at least not as badly, if Christianity were false. Again, this says nothing about whether or not Christianity is actually true, but it's a very strange admission indeed that you think the world would be a better place if your religion is wrong. Shouldn't we expect there to be a standard that we expect that we, that they should uphold? And shouldn't we expect to see them fail at that standard? Not really, no. I mean, yeah, the Bible has a lot of loopholes designed to explain away the instances of Christians behaving badly, but you would expect that if Christianity were true, and the people who believed in it really did believe it, and that the God they believed in is omnipresent, 
then there'd be a whole lot less behaving in ways that I wouldn't if someone were watching going on, because they believe that someone is always watching, and this is a someone that they should have direct experience with, so they know for sure that he is, in fact, right there watching them. Also, we'd expect there to not be more than one single Christian denomination, since Jesus prayed to himself in John 17 that all of his followers, and those who come to be his followers through their words, would be perfectly unified in their message, with the explicit purpose of this unified message being to show the world that God really did send Jesus to die for their sins. The very existence of multiple denominations of Christianity is itself excellent evidence against the truth of Christianity, as Jesus himself said that that wouldn't be a thing that would happen if Christianity were true. And shouldn't we expect our own desires to be confronted by the truth of Christianity? Mm -hmm. Because we are fallen too. Only if you're willing to throw out the moral argument for God. You can't say that our agreement on morality is evidence for God and then turn right around and say that our desires which go against God's morality are also evidence for God because that's evidence of the fall. This disparity in moral views makes perfect sense without a God determining morality though. If morality is a trait that evolved, then we'd expect variation to exist within it, because selection pressures applied to variation of traits is exactly how evolution works. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons, and many people have heard this, why I I uh, I think the Christian worldview is compelling is because it's the best explanation for the way things are. It's really not, though. You guys have to come up with these convoluted explanations for God's consistent failure to do anything. So let's do a little thought experiment here, which has the fun little benefit of also showing why Greg's bigotry against LGBTQ people is his own, and that he could choose not to interpret those parts of the Bible in that way if he wanted to. The Bible plainly says in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, that believers in Christ will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, ignoring the demons, tongues, snakes, and poison, let's just focus on healing the sick. It plainly says that believers will be able to heal the sick with the laying on of hands. There are no qualifiers there other than that the person doing the healing is a believer. It says nothing about the faith or firmness of belief of the sick person being healed. And this is just as plain as the verses in Leviticus that forbade male homosexuality. Why, then, do Christians not spend all of their free time in hospitals? There are literally billions of Christians on the planet. It's still the world's largest religion. Surely they can't all be no true Christian out of existence? Fine, sure, whatever. We'll ditch the Catholics and then cut that number down to 25% of what's left. That leaves us with 225 million true Christians worldwide. And there are none that spend their time going through all the hospitals healing the sick. According to Wikipedia's list of children's hospitals worldwide, there are about 262 children's hospitals outside of the U.S., with another 250 within the U.S. If only 25% of non-Catholic Christians are true Christians, then if Christianity were true, there are over 400,000 true Christians for every children's hospital that exists. And yet, not a single children's hospital has a Christian faith healer as part of their staff, whose job it is to just go around healing kids. Hell, if I were a Christian and had magical healing powers like that, I wouldn't even bother applying to be on the staff. I would just sit in the waiting room and heal every kid who comes through the doors. It would be immoral of me to do otherwise. And yet, not even the Christians who purport to be faith healers can be found doing this sort of thing in hospitals, because their faith healing powers don't work the way the Bible says they should work. Sure, the faith healers are likely to blame the victim, saying they didn't believe hard enough, but again, I'd remind you that Jesus put no such stipulation on the healing powers. It is the faith of the healer that matters, not the person being healed. The world we would expect to see if Christianity were true is one where, with this many Christians running around, the concept of going to see a doctor is just obsolete. Everyone can just go to their Christian healer. But that's not what we see, because faith healing doesn't actually work. And as a nice little cap on this thought experiment, on Greg's website we can find articles talking about how wrong Christian faith healers are, saying that the Bible never promises physical healing, while conspicuously avoiding Mark 16, 17 through 18, and instead focusing on the much more nebulously worded 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25. I even searched for that verse on Kokel's site. I couldn't find a single article that mentions it. I tried several variations on the search. So just those two verses specifically, going all the way to verse 19, including the whole of the Great Commission that starts in verse 14, and starting at 14, well, ending at either 18 or 19. 
For good measure, I even verified that the format I was using to search for verses would actually work, and tried it with 1 Peter 2, 24-25, and would you look at that, the article that I was talking about comes right up. While this is not an exhaustive list of the possible ways to search for those verses, it is a true statement that finding an article on Greg's website that actually deals with Jesus explicitly stating that believers will be able to heal anyone they choose to is difficult, if not impossible. So clearly, Greg is capable of ignoring verses that explicitly state things that he disagrees with, he just chooses not to when it comes to his bigotry. That is, every particular detail is exactly what you'd expect of a religious view that matches the way the world is. Only if you have an incredibly warped view of the world, or haven't thought through the implications of your religion actually being true. And this whole point, Amy, about, in a sense, judging the claims of Christianity as a worldview by the behavior of Christians is, is such a big mistake. Why, though? There are behaviors that I have that my partner doesn't like, and vice versa. We both actively work to avoid engaging in those behaviors because we love each other, and we both know that the other exists. If I talked about my partner all the time and agreed that there are behaviors that she doesn't like that I am prone to, and claimed that I loved her, but then still engaged in those behaviors and always had excuses as to why you can never meet her, then that might cause you to doubt her existence. If you actually love someone and know they exist, and you know that they don't like certain behaviors of yours, then you work on correcting those behaviors. Now, this does kind of fall apart when comparing it to a real human relationship, because the behaviors I'm talking about are things like making sure I get all the beard hairs that fall on the floor counter and sink when I trim my beard. Reasonable stuff like that. Whereas God expects you to deny being the way he made you. And that's not even just about LGBTQ people, that's everyone. As Romans 8.13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that's not the only verse. Just do a search on Bible Gateway for the flesh. There are plenty of verses saying you have to deny the flesh, crucify the flesh, not live in the flesh, etc. With the flesh being your earthly body with its desires. You know, the body that God knitted together in your mother's womb, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made? That body? So God made you in a way that was displeasing to him, and demands that you behave otherwise. And if you don't, you get thrown into a pit of fire where you'll be consciously tormented for all of eternity. That's abusive as fuck. It's like, as if I said, well, I thought about atheism for a while, and then I read about all these mass murderers who are atheists, so I never gave it another thought. I mean, that certainly is an argument that Christian apologists like to trot out with the claim that it's evidence against atheism. It certainly would be damning to this point if I could find an article written by Greg himself that says something along the lines of, it is true that it's possible that religion can produce evil, and generally when we look closer at the details, it produces evil because the individual people are actually living in a rejection of the tenets of Christianity, and a rejection of the God that they are supposed to be following. So it can produce it, but the historical fact is that outright rejection of God and institutionalizing of atheism actually does produce evil on incredible levels. We're talking about tens of millions of people as a result of the rejection of God. Especially if the article in question were titled something inflammatory like The Real Murderers, Atheism or Christianity? Good thing that's not a thing that exists and definitely doesn't have a link to in the description. Well, obviously, the the conduct of some atheists doesn't tell you about the credibility of atheism as an ideology. Okay then, Greg. Take down your article where you heavily imply, if not explicitly state, that it does. By the way, I do think that there is a, is a connection between the belief that there is no accountability of any sort and there are no moral constraints, and the excesses that we see atheists do. I mean, there is a connection between beliefs and actions. Yeah, okay, just backtracking then as you realize you just undermined the whole atheist dictators did bad things argument. Gotcha. But there is also a disconnect, and so you can have people who are Christians, or say they are, and live totally non-Christian lives in their behavior. People like Greg here, who advocates for being an asshole to LGBTQ people in order to avoid the appearance of approving of their behavior, when the example Jesus set was to shun the pious in order to spend time hanging out with the prostitutes, tax collectors, and other sinners. 
The Jesus that most people think of, the good and gentle teacher who taught us to love each other and be kind and non-judgmental, would shun Greg as a Pharisee for being too concerned with forcing conformity to the law instead of focusing on loving everyone where they're at and encouraging change through being an example for them rather than insisting that they behave the way he wants them to. Now, of course, this common picture of Jesus is hard to reconcile with the guy who told people to sell their cloaks to buy swords, to slaughter his enemies at his feet, and said that you have to hate your whole family if you want to follow him. But those are verses that apologists ignore as well in order to make Jesus look better, so I'm honestly at a bit of a loss where these guys get their picture of Jesus from. It certainly doesn't seem to be biblically based. And then we can ask, what, by what standard are you judging the Christians? Yeah. By the standard of wanting to improve the lives of as many people as possible by as much as possible which, in my opinion, is a way better standard than the one that has to qualify that torturing babies is only wrong if it's done for fun, rather than just agreeing that it's always wrong. That we know that it's objectively wrong to torture infants for fun. Every one of us knows that torturing an innocent baby for fun is wrong. Do we understand that torturing babies for fun is really wrong? That it's truly always wrong to torture a baby for fun. I know you guys don't like that this isn't a might makes right scenario, but in my experience, grounding morals in empathy itself will always have better outcomes than grounding them in a system that uses weaponized empathy to coerce otherwise good people into doing bad things. Where does your stand standard come from? So then you can get into the moral argument and the idea that that requires a standard above us, above human beings, yeah. by which we can judge everyone otherwise. <laughs> No matter what the Christians do in the church, their standard is correct because they're all agreeing on it. Yeah, no, this isn't morality by democracy. And the things that these people are doing in the church are things that they often wouldn't be able to get away with if it wasn't in a church setting. Because in a church, the parishioners are told that they need to respect the church leaders because they are people of God. And people of God are good people, God's representatives on earth. The church actively enables preachers who are the causes of these bad experiences, and instead of just condemning bad people for being bad people, you have to get your jab in and say, well, because the church approved of it, it can't be bad, because the only moral system I can possibly think of that isn't divine command theory is morality by democratic vote. So if you can convince people to vote that immoral things are moral, they become moral automatically. It's not only kind of gross, but it shows just how little thought apologists are willing to put into potential moral systems other than their own. They're doing what they do, what they want to do. And somebody might say, well, it's their standard I'm judging. I'm judging them by their standard. They're not keeping it, so they're hypocrites. Oh, right then, you just inserted your standard. Hypocrisy is wrong. Um, is hypocrisy not wrong by the Christian standard? If I'm performing an internal critique where I hypothetically grant that Christianity is where my morality comes from, then when I say they're being hypocritical by their own standard, I am also using their own standard to say that hypocrisy is wrong. To turn that last bit around and insist that it's the non-Christian using their own personal standard is essentially to admit that hypocrisy is not wrong in the Christian worldview. Did Jesus not say in Matthew 23, 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Seems like a pretty explicit condemnation of hypocrisy to me. So if I agree to use your moral standard to critique the morality of the Bible or the actions of Christians, then hypocrisy is indeed wrong. Now, I do happen to also think that it's wrong by my own standard, but I don't need to use mine to come to that conclusion. Which I agree with you, but the point we're making is that the, this turns out to be a self-defeating a self kind of an analysis. No, it doesn't. You just tried to sneakily swap what kind of an analysis it was halfway through. If you're admitting that you agree that hypocrisy is wrong, then an internal critique, using your standard as the standard of judgment, will yield the result that the hypocrite is in the wrong. How is that self-defeating? You can't get away from these kinds of mm -hmm. assessments. And you apparently are incapable of hypothetically considering those types of assessments without misrepresenting what they even are. And I also suspect that this goes back to what we've talked about a couple episodes ago about the idea that Christianity is about making you good. And so therefore Christianity doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work because it doesn't make you good. You're still a sinner. Mm -hmm. And 
you discussed this of what C.S. Mm-hmm. Lewis's idea about uh, you have to judge the person before and after they became a Christian, not just against other people. Right. That's not what the Bible says. It says, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. It doesn't say that you need to compare the fruit of the tree before and after it became a Christian tree, but a good tree will only bear good fruit. This is where you need, again, to talk about the purpose of Christianity. Don't assume that they understand Mm -hmm. the gospel. Remember, this is ostensibly within the context of asking a former Christian why they are no longer a Christian. Don't assume that a former believer in the gospel understands the gospel. Talk down to them like they haven't heard a bajillion times by now how great the sacrifice was when God came down to earth and gave himself over to torture and humiliation in order that your sins might be forgiven. No former Christian understands that. They probably haven't even heard it before. Give me a break. They might not ever have understood it. They might think it's just, it's a way to be good. And, and if it doesn't work, then I want to do it a different way. Well, certainly the way it was promoted at PragerU, where they have a whole ass video explaining that that's exactly why an atheist should take their kids to church. Which I did indeed respond to. Card in the corner, link in the description, and all of that. And I know me bringing up PragerU is not necessarily relevant here, but Greg has referred to Dennis Prager of PragerU as his colleague, so he seems to at least agree with some of his stuff. So when somebody says that Jesus didn't work, uh, the question is, what is it that you expected him to do? And again, they're just making shit up. Who said that Jesus didn't work? How is this in any way helpful to the original questioner? Jesus works really well for what he was intended to accomplish. Which, apparently, did not include things that he explicitly said that he did intend to accomplish, like the aforementioned granting of healing powers to his followers, and the perfectly unified message that they would also have. If we, have, if we have false expectations, and there was a lot of this during the Jesus movement, the, how we drum up how wonderful the Christian life is going to be, and Jesus will get your kids off drugs, and will make you happy all the time, and you'll never have any difficulties and all that stuff. Well, this is just not true. Well, that's a refreshing admission. I've seen so many apologists use the fact that they no longer do drugs, or are happier now, or they are faithful in their marriage now, etc., as a reason you should be a Christian. Glad to hear that Greg disagrees with that particular tactic. His others are just as slimy, though. And so if you expect Jesus to do something that Jesus was not intended to do, well, you're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Which then leads to another question. Why would Jesus not intend to make his followers' lives better while they're on earth? I get that an excellent case can be made for asceticism with several passages in the Gospels and several more in Paul's writings, but surely the reason that this was seen as a viable strategy is because God would take care of all your earthly needs, so you didn't need to worry about taking care of those things for yourself. Jesus pretty explicitly states that in the Sermon on the Mount, after all. So, just to sum up, ask them if they're open to hearing responses to their concerns, ask them if they... if they want to know if God exists? If God exists, do they want to know? If, when they said deconstructed, they meant what is usually meant by that word, that's a question they've already investigated, so asking them that will come off as dismissive of their experience at best. And have them think about that. They have. That's why they're no longer Christian. Or at least that's what is very much implied by the language used in that question, which you guys completely ignored in order to make a bunch of unjustified assumptions about the specifics of this person's situation. I think some people would say no, actually, (laughs) if they're really honest about it. They don't want to know because their issue is with what this God demands. I haven't met anyone who said that they weren't interested in knowing the truth. I have met people who say that they would not worship the Bible God because of those things even if he were real, but that is very different from not even wanting to know if he's real. If the God of the Bible exists, do you want to know that? Should you want to know that? Obviously you should want to know that because this has some implications for everybody's life. If any God exists, I want to know that because that will have implications. But. If that God wants me to know that, then that is that God's responsibility. 
I have laid out the reasons why I'm convinced that the Christian God does not exist, and I have not seen sufficient counters to those reasons to convince me that he does. And also, Christians have this weird assumption that their religion is just obviously the one that everyone should focus all of their time and energy into fully studying and understanding. Which is understandable, it's the one that they think is actually true after all, but from the perspective of someone who has no religion, I would need to know what stands out about Christianity that would justify my spending extra time and effort on it, rather than on Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or Neopaganism or any of a myriad of other options. And as much as it is the one that I do actually spend my time on, that's because I used to be a Christian, and as such, I understand it better than the other ones. On top of the fact that Christianity has a massive influence on North American politics, so its impact on my life is more direct, even as a non-believer, than any of those other religions. But for someone who isn't concerned about the direct political influence of Christianity in their lives, possibly because they live somewhere that doesn't have to deal with that, why should they focus on Christianity over other religions? There's no real good answer there. But what you're going to find out is that they don't really like the God of the Bible all that much. Uh, so there's a spiritual issue here, and um, I think praying is definitely a good way to go. And thankfully you're doing that, so that's great. Yeah, it's not about dislike of the God of the Bible, it's about that God being internally inconsistent. Dislike of a thing does not make me stop believing in that thing, especially if I am a former believer who actually liked that thing in the past and had a personal experience with it. I've talked before on my channel about my dislike for mint. It triggers my disgust reflex more strongly than anything else that I'm aware of. I intensely hate it. But I have at least one memory of myself as a very young child enjoying a bowl of mint chocolate chip ice cream at my grandmother's house. I don't know when I went from being able to enjoy it, to it being so disgusting to me as to actually cause a physical reaction. Another childhood memory is me throwing up in the dentist chair because they didn't have any toothpaste flavors other than mint. Nor do I understand why. But I do not deny the very existence of mint. That would just be silly. I've had personal experiences with mint in the past, and people that I know continue to have personal experiences with it. But when I left Christianity, it was because of the realization that the God of Christianity doesn't make any sense, and that the experiences that I had interpreted as being personal experiences with God are all feelings that could be achieved through purely secular means as well, and have pretty well understood mechanisms in the brain. But again, apologists can't admit that my experience here is a valid one. They have to ignore people like me, usually by attacking the idea that people like me were ever true believers in the first place, rather than engaging with us honestly and sincerely. And that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Lisa Boban, who says, Yeah, don't ever do that last bit again. Which I assume is with reference to the outtakes from last week's video, where I basically mooned everyone who watched that far as part of a he probably doesn't wear pants when the camera can't see his legs type of gag. I can understand why people wouldn't want to see that, but it is just a but. Not a particularly nice but, but that makes it funnier in my opinion. That said, one of the reasons I do okay for myself as a self-employed YouTuber, but often found myself bouncing between jobs out in the real world, is because of one of the symptoms of ADHD. If someone tells me to do something in a way that suggests that I don't have the option of doing otherwise, my gut reaction is to not do what I've been told, or to do it, but badly. As a result, I've often not been a perfect employee, especially if I feel like I'm being forced to do something that doesn't make sense to me. Now, with that information in mind, I'll tell you that when I read this comment, my gut reaction was to make sure I now do something similar to that with more frequency. Not every video, gotta keep you on your toes after all, but enough to drive the people who don't want to see it absolutely nuts. Now, I recognize that this is a shortcoming on my part, I'm not going to do that and then blame you for it, that would be ridiculous, but consider wording comments of this nature in a way that doesn't imply that you have some sort of control over how I run my channel. You never know when you might push a neurospicy content creator into making more stuff that you don't like. Though it does sometimes have amusing results, like when fellow adhd -er Linus of Linus Tech Tips ended up selling a shirt at a loss just to make a point about how tax write-offs work. And of course, I say all of this while fully recognizing the fact that you do not owe me a view. If I do something that you don't like, and continue to do that thing, you don't have to watch. And I understand that comments like this come from a place of them wanting to guide me into not doing that, so I appreciate the thought, but I just wanted to share a little bit of what it's like to live inside my brain. Thanks for watching! I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I livestream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern and... Oh, shit. Um... Looks like my little elephant dude in the background fell over. Just wait, wait a second while I fix it.
What, did, did, you, did you expect me to be wearing a thong again? Come on, don't be crass. I wouldn't do that twice in a row. Watch out for next week, though. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorship manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, David Chadwick, and all the rest, who are the thong that is up the butt that is my channel. If you'd like to wedge yourself between these sweet, sweet cheeks, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. That one might have been worse than the time I called my patrons cum. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! not. Okay, drop it. Drop the ball. Hey, good girl. Good girl. Good girl. That is way too small for you to be chewing on. You're going to choke on that. No, not like that. Nope, 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 nope. Down. Up. You see the bumper? You see the pupper? She keeps touching my microphone, so I might not be able to get her in the anything but the outtakes. <sighs> Off. No, that doesn't. Okay. Okay. And that was a source of great pain for them because of how much the what? You lick in my ear while I'm trying to record. Thanks. And given that there are good reasons to think that most of them are false. What's that dog doing? If a representative from one of those religions presents me with a good re Stop it! Stop! You're too loud! What are you even playing with? Where are you getting these things that you are playing with? You need to stop. You've got- there's, there's dog toys. There's dog toys you can play with. You don't need to play with kid toys. Look, look, here's your rope. You love this rope. Play with the rope.